Thank you for that really nice introduction, Ron, um, and for having me, Dan, and for all of you for being here. This is, as you know, a really historic city for philanthropy. It's kind of ground zero, so it's a delight for me to, to be able to talk to you today about philanthropy. And uh, I decided actually to kind of focus on my first book, the, the kind of the broader overview of, of philanthropy, but I'll be happy during the question and answer period to kind of zero in on how this is relevant to today's politics, which is the topic of the second book. Um, but, and I know a lot of you know about, a lot about philanthropy, or probably deeply involved in it yourselves, and I salute you for that. But I find, and I bet some of you have found this too, that even people who are deeply immersed in the charitable sector today often underestimate the, the real power and capacity of that, of that business. And so my main t goal today is to convince you that philanthropy is more than the way it's conventionally viewed often, which is kind of, you know, how would you describe it? A, a nice civilizing coat of paint on the American mansion. That actually that's not right. That philanthropy is something much deeper and, and much more part of our foundation and, and structure in this country. We'd be a, a really different and lesser nation without it. So let me start with just some brute numbers. I don't know if you realize that 11% of all U.S. workers in this country work in the, the charitable sector today. Or that Americans now voluntarily give away $373 billion every single year. And by the way, that's just the cash. On top of that, you really have to add the value of the volunteer labor that we all put up. And reasonable estimates of that would roughly double that, that giving. So to give you some perspective, this is much, much bigger than the so-called military industrial complex you often hear about, which is used as a kind of a metaphor for you know, a significant industry. Well, the charitable business has is, is, is far exceeded that in many other important industries. Despite all this reality, the fact that it's a big part of our economy and an even bigger part of our culture, I think you will agree with me that you rarely hear very interesting or sophisticated discussions of philanthropy in journalism or in politics or in academe. And at first that kind of depressed me when I got into this business in a full-time way several years ago, but then I realized that's our niche. So we at the Philanthropy Roundtable decided to do something about that. We launched a big three-year effort to produce this book. And the book is really built around the three greats, okay? It's the great donors through American history. It's the great accomplishments from literally 1636 to 2017 are in the book. And it's the great ideas that animate and drive philanthropy. Um, and by the way, there's lots of Cleveland and lots of Ohio in this book. You can just see a couple of sample entries here. This is the biographical entry on John Rockefeller in our so-called uh, Philanthropist Hall of Fame. This is an item on the founding of Severance Hall in the Cleveland Orchestra. And um, this is a, a, about the, I'm sure you all know that the very first world, the community, community foundation in the world started here in Cleveland. Um, and you know, even though this book has an obvious kind of encyclopedic aspect to it, that was really our goal. Nonetheless, I want to promise you, it's not snoozy. You know, philanthropy is this long, long Greek word, and it feels kind of dusty, and it feels like an, a, you know, a, a, a hobby for, for for old folks. It's really none of those things. That in fact, philanthropy is a human tale. It's full of it's full of you know flesh and blood human drama, and that's a little bit what I want to bring to you today. Let's start with this guy. This is Ned McElhaney, and he was born and raised on a Louisiana bayou. And I know you're looking at this and saying, that does not look like a Bayou boy to me. But he was one of those kind of Forrest Gump characters who had all of these different phases of life where he did remarkable things. Just had appetites and interests all over the map. And at this point, he was actually an explorer in Alaska, did some amazing things there, including saving the lives of more than 100 sol uh, sailors excuse me, who had gotten iced in by not leaving early enough. And he was a very good shot, and he fed them seabirds all winter to keep them alive. When he returned home, he produced a book about alligators, which is still read. He became one of the world's experts on bamboo and camellias. Don't ask me why. Uh, he personally banded something like a quarter of a million birds. All right, so just one of these hugely energetic and interested people who uh, was always finding things to, uh, to get involved in. Here he is all grown up. And I have to tell you, I look at these two pictures in succession and I get so sad <laughs> because this is what happens when men take off their furs and put on their bow ties, you know, they, and they start paying for life insurance and doing all those responsible things you have to do because, yes, Ned also had a day job and his day job was running the manufacturing and, um, and, and, and selling company that, 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 that uh, produced the hot pepper condiment invented by his family. Now this is Cleveland, I know, and, and you know, n not, not New Orleans, so I'm not sure you had this on your scrambled eggs this morning, but I, I think you've all seen these little red bottles. 
And if you think that selling, you know, burning people's tongues can't make you any money, well, think again. He made a nice pile of money, and he used his profits for an amazing array of good works. For one thing, he got very, um, very attached to a fellow native of the Louisiana bayous. This is the snowy egret, just a gorgeous bird. And when McElhaney was young, uh, he, there, was a, there was a fashion craze. There was a women's fashion craze for hats with egret feathers on them. Now, what I know about fashion would fit in a very tiny slipper, so I had to look all this up. But I went investigating, what are these hats all about? And I found pictures like this, and I thought, well, you know, I might shoot a bird for that. That's pretty fetching. But I found all kinds of other pictures that were just inexplicable and un <laughs> indefensible. And um, obviously, these are silly fashions. But they had a really unsilly effect, which was to make the snowy egret almost extinct. And when he realized this, McElhinney just swung into action. The first thing he did, <clears throat> his family owned an island in southern Louisiana, still owns an island in southern Louisiana. And he went out and literally beat the bushes on this island. And he, over a period of several days, he only managed to find two nests. Right? These birds were almost gone. But he found two nests, and they had eight of these little baby egrets. This is where you say, ooh. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he, he literally stuffed these birds in the pockets of his hunting coat, brought them home, and raised them up in a protected area. And by 1911, he'd built up a private a population of almost 100,000 egrets. And the same time he was doing this on the micro level, he worked with his, some of his donor friends, big foot donors like John Rockefeller and Olivia Sage, and convinced them to buy up what was considered wasteland along the Louisiana coast, swampy areas that were very important habitat for the breeding of these animals. So by working in this kind of double-barreled way, and with both his money and his energy, he really, um, managed to rescue a, a, a magnificent creature that was on the verge of disappearing from Earth. Now, I told you McElhaney was a man of many interests and many talents, and so I want to tell you one other story that kind of gives you a taste of the breadth of his philanthropic projects, and this one's also about extinction. I love that, but it's a very different kind of extinction. This is about cultural extinction instead of animals. Um, I told you he was a Southern boy, and he grew up with Negro spirituals in his ears. All right? And he just loved them. He's crazy about this music. Sing it all the time and kind of encourage his family members to sing it with him. And as best I could tell, sometime around his 60th birthday, he realized he wasn't hearing these songs anymore. And he'd ask people to sing them with him on the front porch, and nobody knew the words. And people couldn't remember the, the melodies and the harmonies. And I think this kind of panicked him. And um, you have to remember, spirituals had been part of an oral tradition only. Right? They had not been written down. They were passed from you know, father to son, mother to daughter. And if one generation just stops that transmission, these things can disappear. So when he realized this, McElhaney went to work. And I think most of you know, most philanthropy is local. And he was very much working in his own backyard. And he very quickly found these two ladies living quite near him who knew lots of the old songs, quite elderly women. And he invited them over to his home. And he hired a musicologist to sit with him. And they invited these two ladies to just sing their hearts out. And as fast as the two men could write, they scrabbled down the lyrics and the melodies and the harmonies of this music. McElhaney then published all these songs as a book, which became a classic of the genre. This is a very crummy old photo, but it's a rare book at this point. There are, are, are 125 spirituals in this book, OK? I went to some trouble to try to figure out how many of those were recorded somewhere else in that form. And it's only five or six. And the rest, you can pretty much thank McElhaney for keeping them alive. And by the way, among the songs that McElhaney kind of rescued for, for future generations was the one that Martin Luther King quoted in his most famous speech when he talked about free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty and free at last. That was one of the uh, McElhaney protected spirituals. Another philanthropist who helped, I think you could say, keep his, uh, his fellow Americans free was this guy. This is Alfred Loomis. And I bet some of you know someone like this. He, he was one of these guys that just couldn't experiment enough. From the time he was knee-high to a grasshopper, he loved science. Okay? And, but when he was in college, his father died. And he realized he could become responsible for the family income. So he better get serious about making a living. Went to law school. Ended up hating that. So he really wanted to get back to science. And he basically made a pitch to his brother-in-law and said, let's go to Wall Street and make as much money as we can so I can get back to science. Because the kind of science I want to do is going to take serious money. <clears throat> and so the two of them set up a firm that, to make a long story short, basically financed the rural electrification of about half of America. This was the internet craze of its day, and bringing wires for the first time into a lot of these counties. Big deal. Made a lot of money. 
very difficult work. And then he brilliantly anticipated the stock market meltdown. And in the summer of 1929, he had gone 100% cash. And then when the market collapsed in October, he bought, 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 bought. And by the early 30s, he was one of the richest men in America. And as he would said he would, he, at that point, completely retired from finance and put all of his energy and most of his money into science. And he bought a, literally bought a mansion, an empty mansion near his home. He lived in the New York City suburbs. And you can imagine how popular this would have been with the rich neighbors. So he buys this mansion and he guts it and he puts it in one of the world's great science labs. And, and he starts inviting eminent scientists from Europe and America to come join him and do exper experiments with him. Now Loomis was an amateur, but he was very gifted science. He was not a dabbler. He was one of the, uh, one of the world experts, really, in the precise measurement of time was one of his specialties. Wave theory was something he knew very well. He published a bunch of papers, uh, had a, held a number of patents, very serious scientist. <clears throat> then, in 1938, Alfred Loomis went to Berlin, and he was stunned by two things. One was how popular Hitler was, and the other was how good the German scientists were. And he came home convinced war was brewing and that science was going to have a lot to do with who won that war. And so he was alarmed and he went into overdrive. Now, he was very well connected. I'm trying to remember, I think it was his cousin was, his, was uh, Henry Stimson, who was the Secretary of War at that time. So he knew people in Washington and he banged the drum. He said, bad things are about to happen and we have to get on things like atomic weapons and that sort of thing. And he was stunned by the response he got from the government labs. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we know about those things, but that's for tomorrow's war. And he said, oh, they are not. He said, you can be sure that the German and Japanese scientists are on this stuff, and if they beat us, it's a disaster. So he um, got nowhere that way and decided, I'm just going to jump into this as best I can as an individual. So he used his own money and his own time and thought hard about what he might be able to contribute as a scientist to the war effort. And he quickly settled on the idea that maybe you could use radio waves to detect moving objects, all right? which is now what we call radar, which did not exist at that point. And he, in very short order, not only became one of the world's theoretical experts in radar, but managed to, within a year, start producing working, active you know, radar sets by the thousands that were put into airplanes and into ships and into shore installations. And these, um, these radar sets changed the course of World War II and completely changed the course. Uh, FDR let, later said that other than Winston Churchill, there was no civilian who did more to win World War II than Alfred Loomis. And I dare say you've not heard the name before today. I, I have to tell you, I hadn't before I began my research. And that kind of ticked me off, <laughs> that this kind of whole world of Privately, uh, privately engineered um, you know, contributions to the, to the, to the nation are, are not better understood. And um, uh, the, uh, the kind of the cherry on, and, and one of the things that really did it for me is it kind of made me realize, my goodness, this is national defense. Can you think of a sector that you would consider less likely for philanthropy to have a role? I mean, this ought to be the ultimate government undertaking. But this was sobering for me when I realized that even here, philanthropists had been very important. I realized, I better rethink. I better think a little more broadly about what philanthropy is capable of. So this, um, this entrepreneurial method it was as important as, as, as the money that, that Lewis put into it. He really had this remarkable method, which I, I don't have time to describe today, but it's in the book. And then the cherry on top for me was I realized as I was finishing my research, that he not only left behind this entrepreneurial method of giving, but he left behind a flesh and blood example as well. I don't know if anyone knows this face. That is Reed Hastings, who is the founder of Netflix, which is a company that has completely upset three separate industries now, by my count, uh, just like his, his grandfather, just a brilliant, great-grandfather, a brilliant businessman. And you may not also realize that Reed Hastings is a profound philanthropist. He is one of the great progenitors of charter schools in this country. So the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Another very entrepreneurial philanthropist who put deep imprints on America is this guy. This is George Eastman, who founded Eastman Kodak and is really the man who popularized photography. And uh, Kodak was a fascinating company. In the early days, you have to remember that the, the whole photographic process was a black box. Nobody had a clue, really, what the basic chemistry was. They kind of fumbled their way into figuring it out, but they didn't really know why it was working. And at one point, uh, 
there was a period for two or three weeks where all of the photographs coming into Kodak were coming out black. Right? You can imagine how popular that would be if these were your daughter's wedding photos or something. This would have killed the company in very, very short order. So, you know, Eastman went into panic mode. This, he, he literally slung a hammock in the corner of the warehouse where Kodak was then operating and just worked on this 24-7 until he had it figured out. And it turned out that what had happened is the cows whose carcasses are boiled down to make gelatin, which is a big part of film. I don't know if you realize that's where gelatin comes from, but it is. Anyway, these cows had been moved to new pastures where the grass had a little bit less elemental sulfur in it than the previous grass. And that tiny change in the chemistry was enough to screw up the process. So when he finally just kind of fumbled his way into figuring this out, he said, never again. You know, I am not going to be a prisoner of that kind of capricious fate. I need to know what's going on. I need to understand the basic chemistry of, of photography. So he started hiring chemists. And he had very good luck <clears throat> with some chemists he uh, hired out of a little school, a little commuter school in Massachusetts called Boston Tech. And in gratitude for these, these, these good uh, employees, he later kind of just on his own, without any inspiration or request, adopted Boston Tech and turned it into today's MIT. And I mean he really turned it into it. I was, in fact, this is an update on what I wrote in the Almanac. I just found out a, a month or two ago that MIT, what's today MIT, had decided to shut down and fold itself into Harvard. He was going to become the engineering department of Harvard because they were in such trouble. And both sides had signed paperwork and everything to do this until a Massachusetts judge got involved and said, nope, that would violate your, your, your state charter. We're not letting you do that. So the, 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 the Boston Tech administrators were crazy. They were panicked. They were about to just lose everything, shut down. When, when Eastman swooped under the scene and said, I'll build you this library. This is their main library. I'll build you an entire brand new campus, and I will basically push you into the big leagues. And of course, it became one of the great research universities in the world. Now, I think probably most of you know that uh, passion, just enthusiasm and, and determination and passion plays a huge role in philanthropy. We never get in the role of passion at the Philanthropy Roundtable. You want to give $10 million to kitty cats, we'll help you do it in the very best possible way. Uh, it's not my thing, but you know, if you are enthusiastic and really determined and passionate about something, you will probably do good work. And one, I want to discuss, use Eastman as an example of how, what passion can lead to, because one of his passions was music. He was just crazy about music. He, was, he would literally take these musical jags where he'd go to New York City and he'd take in 12 operas in, in a weekend. And um, one of the women that accompanied him on one of these trips wrote in her journal, I just love this, she said, George is absolutely alcoholic about music. And I thought, that's perfect. I was in his house actually a couple months ago in, in Rochester and uh, he installed two full-size pipe organs in his home and he hired a guy to come over and play toccatas and fugues every morning to wake him up his alarm clock. So he was, you know, you could say it was out of control. I mean, this is, isn't this kind of extreme? Isn't this a runaway? You know, yes, but that's what really sometimes great, great things flow out of that kind of really determined effort. And it was, of course, Eastman who, just by act of will, created and built into prominence the Eastman School of Music, whose main auditorium you see here. And the Eastman School was hugely important in popularizing pop, uh, classical music and in Americanizing classical music. Until then, you had to go to Europe if you wanted to be a conductor or a concertmaster. All that changed here. Um, another very idiosyncratic donor who poured money into world-changing research was Catherine McCormick. Oh, by the way, so I'm pu I put this slide into my slideshow. I'm getting ready to write about her, and then I look closely at it. Anybody notice anything? She's wearing egret feathers on her shoulder. <laughs> So we have dueling philanthropists here. Um, uh, McCormick was the inheritor of the, um, the uh, McCormick you know, Reaper Foundation, and excuse me, Reaper F Fortune. And um, you know, I think most of you know that, for instance, the polio vaccine was a product of philanthropy. A lot of people know that yellow fever was wiped out with Rockefeller money. So we know that philanthropy has a big role in medical uh, developments, but I, I doubt you know that the birth control pill was the product of a single soul founder, and you are looking at her. She uh, eventually put up, <laughs> now, now, <laughs> she, she eventually put up the current equivalent of about $20 million by my math to 
just force into existence this, this dramatic social changing new technology. And I, folks, I don't mean she wrote a check to a university and walked away. I don't mean she and six other companies did it. I mean, she did it alone. She wrote the money. She was in the lab every day. She, she was actually one of the early graduates of MIT herself, had biology training. She hired this crazy biologist that had been thrown out of Harvard, who was quite brilliant, a little bit unscrupulous. And the two of them worked together. And by 1957, they had an FDA approved pill, which of course changed the world. And Again, this was her life's dream. She was just so thrilled by this. At one point, she actually she asked to have a script written in her own name so she could go into her local pharmacy and have it filled, even though at that point she was a matron in her 80s. So <laughs> didn't really need it. Now, I want to even tighten the focus a little t tighter here on this idea of how important personal factors can be in philanthropy. This is a guy named Michael Brown. And he was a Broadway lyricist, which I totally identify, because I spent a lot of my life as a freelance writer, which is a good way to go broke. And lyricists are just like that. You know, you have years and years and years where your wife looks at you with a side eye and says, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, you get lucky and something happens. And this is exactly what happened to Brown. In 1956, he had a hit musical, all right? So he had this big gush of money that he could never have anticipated. And he felt blessed and lucky, so they invited for Christmas that year, he and his wife and their two boys invited a local starving artist to come uh, share Christmas with him. She was from the South, long way from home, didn't have any friends there in New York. And at the end of their Christmas exchange, they said, you know, go on up to the tree. There's a little envelope for you there. So she went up and inside that envelope was a simple note that said just this, you have one year off from your job to write whatever you please. Merry Christmas. And the writer's name was Harper Lee. And um, you might remember, Harper Lee was from Alabama. And when she realized she wanted to be a novelist, what do people do? They go to New York City, right? And what happens when they get there? They can't pay the rent. They're so you know, darn busy trying to make money to pay the rent, they can't make any progress in their craft. In her case, she was working in a bookstore and an airline office. And just so worn out and, and, and demanded by those things that she uh, was not doing any writing. And the Browns noticed this. Okay, they were good friends and they noticed this. And they acted on it. Um, now, Harper Lee agonized over which, whether she should accept this. This is a pretty intimate uh, intervention. But she eventually did. And it was with that donation in hand, uh, she quit her two retail jobs I described to you. And it was during that gift year that she wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. And it went on to win the Pulitzer in 1961 and completely changed the course of American literature. Now, I'm sure some of you are saying to yourself, hmm, is that philanthropy? I don't know. That's a little personal for me. I mean, make up your own mind. My definition of philanthropy would be something like you identify a person who's not meeting their God-given potential, right, for one reason or another, and you decide that with a little boost from you, they could get a lot closer. And to me, that this case meets that. Now, admittedly, it's a much more personal, much more intimate style of intervention than what we're used to, but to me, that's part and parcel. Now, the, the, uh, the definition of philanthropy you're much more used to is, is this, you know, the Ford Foundation. Everybody thinks about the Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation, or, or some of these, you know, some of these big individual donors who I've been describing to you, they think, well, that's American philanthropy, right? Wrong. I mean, this is a part of American philanthropy. Those, those big donors are certainly a portion, but they are not even close to the mainstream. Um, I hope... Um, some of you know this data right here. This is the latest data, um, which shows that only 15% of all the giving that takes place in this country in a given year comes from foundations. And only another 5% comes from corporations. And the rest, 80%, comes from individuals. And most of that, by the way, comes from very average middle class uh, families who give at the rate of about $2,600 per household, which may not sound like a lot to you, but Multiply for me $2,600 by 100-something million households. See what number you get. This is the mainstream of American philanthropy. It is a big mass undertaking. It is not a game for moguls alone. Now, this is a really important point. So I do some extended storytelling in the Almanac of American Philanthropy about some just remarkable things that have been achieved by very everyday people. I mean, in, including some very low-income people. I mean, there's stories of guys 
run shoe shine stands and washer women and the incredible things that they were able to do. I, I won't get into that today, but I do want to quickly give you an example that's based right here in your own community that helps illustrate what I'm trying to drive at here, but the power of small giving, the, the power of dispersed giving that can aggregate and come together. Um, I happen to be reading a book where I read that in 1880, your home state here of Ohio had 37 different colleges. All right, that kind of struck me as interesting, but I wasn't quite sure what it meant. So I looked up for comparison, how many colleges do you suppose the entire country of England had in that same year, in 1880? England had 23 million population versus only 3 million people in Ohio, so much bigger. Nonetheless, England had only four colleges at that time. That struck me as interesting. I thought, what is going on there? So I dug in on this. Basically, the short story is you had at a, at a time when this was a, not a wealthy state and there was a lot of uh, people struggling here to make a living, you had sacrificial giving going on by average people to build up a infrastructure of education so that the next generation would be able to thrive. Let me show you the map of what colleges existed in Ohio in 1826. You can see there are five colleges here. I picked 1826 because that's the year that Western Reserve was founded, which of course grew into Case Western. Uh, as you know, a very eminent school with all kinds of impressive science and business graduates. But folks, when in 1826, when Western Reserve was founded, there wasn't any Cleveland. This was founded, and this, this was a mosquito bite on the backside of America, okay? This was the frontier. This was the Wild West. And it's really remarkable that people were talking about building colleges and universities, and it was a bunch of low-income farmers who were doing this. There's some beautiful stories. I, I read some stories. There was one guy, for instance, who had a whole bunch of wagons and teams of horses that he didn't need in the winter. So his contribution to, to Western Reserve was to haul stone back and forth between the quarry and the campus all winter. That's what he could do. That's what he did do. There were other families that set aside a part of their egg money or their milk money. It's kind of laughable. You know, you kind of giggle. Building a college on egg money? Good luck. Well, that's what was done. My grandma had egg money, and that was her discretionary income. That meant a lot to her. Uh, this is, uh, my, I have roots in the Columbus area on a dairy farm. And so uh, there were all kinds of stories like that about basically very modest people making sacrifices so that their children would have an education. Now, it wasn't just local either. So what happened? Around the 1840s, <clears throat> a bunch of churches in the East got wind of this. And this was not just happening in Ohio, but also in Kentucky and Tennessee and all kinds of places. And they got wind of this, and they were very touched and very inspired that there were people of modest means making real sacrifices so that in this democracy where everyone gets a vote, we were going to have an educated populace, not a bunch of yahoos. And they wanted to help, so they started a campaign to support these Western colleges. And over a period of decades, they made repeated donations uh, that, that uh, nurtured a whole bunch of colleges. And folks, you can be sure it was nickels and dimes in the collection plate. All right? That's probably all it was. But put nickels and dimes in every week, and all the churches around you are doing the same thing, and you do that for decades, and big things happen. This is where you have to have a little faith. Let me show you what the slide of Ohio colleges looked like when that campaign by the churches had been going on um, about 25 years. And you can see there's just this explosion of, of colleges. It's up to 36, I think, at this point. This is what happens when little streams come together and make bigger streams, and they come together and make rivers, and then they become mighty rivers. Um, <clears throat> let me give you another example of the power of, let's call this, uh, you know, disaggregated giving or small-scale giving. I don't know if you realize that Americans now as individuals now give away much more money to poor people, very poor people in overseas countries than we do as a government. This is the latest data just out this month, and you can see that um, our private donations to poor people in other countries amount to $44 billion, and our entire government aid is only $33 billion. And this is mostly made up of, you know, $25 checks to save the children or mercy ships. And you might, when you're writing that check, think to yourself, oh, I'm just a drop in the bucket. What am I doing? I can't fix any big problems this way. You're wrong. This is what happens when everybody does their part. Little gifts come together to make very, very big waves. Um, now, I think what some people like about government programs is that they're, they're more visible. They're large, they're uniform, they're predictable. Everyone's marching in the same direction. But, um, you know, Ron mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned I worked in the White House for three years, and I can tell you, it, 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 the problem with government policy is everything swings in one direction at one time when you change a federal rule. There's no alternative to that. And there were many times I just craved the capacity to, to, to turn, on the dial, turn the dial a little bit, see what happens. Or maybe to have different rules in Utah than we had in New Jersey and kind of test that out. You can't do that. 
Right? You cannot do that in federal policy. However, philanthropy does that all the time. Local variations, small scale tests, even in the same city, you sometimes get radically different ways of treating drug abuse or homelessness or whatever it might be. And that trial and error process is powerful. Um, and, you know, I talk to people in the World War II generation, like my mom, and she, she, you know, her view is a big hammer is what you need for a big problem. And I keep saying, well, actually, that's not quite true, Mom. And I, I'm trying to use the computer revolution as a metaphor here. When I first got interested in computers, this is what a computer was, a huge big thing where all the wires lead to one central processor. And we quickly learned that's actually a crummy way to solve a lot of problems. You want to really master complicated issues, this is what you want. This is a so-called hackathon, and it looks like chaos, but we learned quickly, I think, that one person with a laptop can do amazing things. This is obviously how the internet was built, all right? It wasn't any big agency that built the internet. It wasn't a big corporation. It wasn't a big anything. The internet is a mosaic of tiny little contributions that come together and make a huge, uh, a huge network. And that pattern of complex problems being solved by small actors without any centralized control is, is not just the story of the internet. That you get examples of that all through biology, all through human history. This is a very powerful natural pattern. Let me quickly, as I wind up here, show you. This is what's going on in business today. Anybody recognize the common denominator in these? This is how the Marriott company now does hotels, all right? They, they don't, you can, if you want to stay in a Marriott, you still can. But if you want to have an extended stay, you're probably going to be in a Fairfield Suites or a Residence Inn. If you want a, you know, a luxury experience, you're going to go to St. Regis or the Ritz-Carlton. Those aren't just like fake name tags on a different part of the same Marriott bureaucracy. Those are basically independent entities with their own budgets, their own staff, their own rules, different ways of serving people in different environments with different needs. And this is the way American business is moving at a very high speed these days. And folks, this is what philanthropy has done forever. Take Goodwill Industries, one of my favorite charities. You realize there's no such thing as one Goodwill. There are 165 different chapters of Goodwill. Everyone has their own budget. Everyone has their own board of directors, their own rules, their own ways of operating. There are 1,400 chapters of Habitat. Again, each of them self-governing and self-deciding. Uh, and so that decentralized network can really accomplish amazing things. So I think it's very important for philanthropists to stop being defensive about this and to say, oh, you know, little old us, we're just localized. We, 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 we only work on the human scale. We don't work on the national scale. Well, that's why you are effective, and the whole world is moving in that direction. Let me close by, <clears throat> just so you don't think I'm a complete Pollyanna, by acknowledging that not all philanthropists are, are saints, okay? Just to give you a quick example, this is J. Paul Getty. Some of you might remember this guy. Um, he was, at a time when he was literally the richest man in the world, he installed a pay phone at his estate so that his guests would pay for their own phone calls. <laughs> Uh, some of you might remember his grandson got kidnapped for, and held for ransom. Anybody remember this? And the kidnappers wanted $17 million. And Grandpa got involved. Well, that sounds a little high to me. Let's get that down. <laughs> and to the point where the kidnappers literally cut off the poor grandson's ear and mailed it to Grandpa, at which point he kind of shut up. But even then, he decided he was only going to pay as much of the ransom as was tax deductible. Don't ask me why any ransom is tax deductible, but he paid $2.2 .2 million, and the rest he gave to his son, the boy's father, as a loan at 4% interest. So not exactly a you know, warm and fuzzy kind of guy. But J. Paul Getty also gave the world the most sublime collection of Greek and Roman art. I was just out there last month. It just, it, it, folks, when we are dust in the ground, these things that he left behind are going to be elevating people's souls and inspiring them to do great things. Um, and that is the magic of philanthropy. You don't have to be an angel to participate, okay? The brilliant thing about the mechanism is it takes us just as we are. And it isn't just Jay Paul. If you're honest, every one of us has that same mix of greed and selfishness and goodness and, and kindness inside of us, all swirling around in a mix. And philanthropy can deal with that. It can take that and say, we'll work with you. We'll figure you out. We'll shame you or help you or encourage you or hold your hand to help you do good things for your fellow man. That's the really wondrous thing about the whole institution. So if I've done nothing else um, this uh, afternoon, I hope I've convinced you that philanthropy is just a huge and, and, and fascinating and powerful aspect of our culture. I've only just scratched the surface of what's in the book, I assure you. But um, I hope you'll, um, you'll, you'll, um, you'll always keep in mind that, again, voluntary giving in this country isn't just a, a cute hobby. All right? It's not just a little sideline. It's a, it's a really uh, a fundamental part of our, of our country's success. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and take your questions. <laughs>